So welcome to the second edition of our podcast, The Dose of Digital Health. And today I'm joined by Jenny Partridge, who is the Innovation Manager for Kent, Surrey and Sussex Academic Health Science Network. So welcome, Jenny. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became Innovation Manager at Kent, Surrey and Sussex AHSM. Um, Great. So I have worked for Kent, Surrey and Sussex Academic Health Science Network for a year and a half now. Prior to that, I was a practice manager, um, a manager of a, a primary care network and federation um, in Farnham, in Surrey, and I've worked in primary care in Berkshire as well. So had many years of uh, introducing innovations from within um, practice management, but then wanted to expen- extend, uh, extend that uh, to a broader remit. Uh, so I've been lucky enough to help primary care with innovations over the last 18 months. So do you have a natural affinity to innovation within healthcare then? I'd say so, yes. I mean, I've always been interested in in improving things. So actually one of my early uh, roles was, I used to make Mars bars for a living. And then I moved into a continuous improvement role within within Mars. So I got very interested then in how you can improve the way you do things and using the ideas of people that work in the organisation to, to make things better, more efficient, or maybe it's better taste or better safety or whatever it might be. Okay, so that's really interesting. So tell us about the Academic Health Science Networks, only for those that m- might not know, sure. and, um, and where they come into innovation. Sure, okay. So there's 15 Academic Health Science Networks across England. Um, we exist in order to help bridge the gap between innovators and the health and social care system. We're funded by the NHS and by the Office of Life Sciences. So we operate very much as an independent organisation to to bridge that gap, put people in touch with each other, help to organise pilots and evaluations. So you can see the benefit of innovation, how it might work and share best practice so innovation can be spread across the country. Okay, that's excellent. And am I right in thinking that it's recently been announced that the name is changing? Absolutely. So we have a five-year funding licence and it's just been announced by the government that that licence is going to be uh, renewed. So from the 1st of October in 2023, we're going to be renamed the Health Innovation Network. Slightly easier, I think, for people to understand what we are and what we do. Yeah, because I think the AHSN network itself Mm -hmm. is a bit of a mouthful. And and some of the clinicians that I've spoken to and also other innovators Mm -hmm. aren't aware of the AHSN. And I think... Health Innovation Network actually is does what it says on the tin, doesn't Absolutely. it? It makes more sense. Yes, yeah. And I must admit, early in my career, I spent a lot of time trying to explain to people what the Academic Health Science Network was. And the word academic, for some people, straight away they think, oh, well, it's a little bit sort of ivory tower, a bit disconnected from the real world. And actually, we do have an academic arm and a research arm who do some fabulous work. But our end of things is very much about introducing innovation into healthcare. How can we make it work more effectively? How can we make things better for patients, ultimately, and for staff? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, we, as a company, DXS, we have first-hand experience of the great work the AHS and Network do. Mm-hmm. But you're right, the academic, does people think, well, is that yes. us? Is it, it, it sounds like there's a lot of work to do and we're absolutely. not really... Into, so I think it's a good, a good idea to change yes. the name. And, it's, and welcome that you have another five-year licence. So that's, absolutely. that's good news, isn't it? Yes, it makes it a lot easier for us now to, to plan ahead, Um, set our strategy in terms of how we're working uh, with different people. I mean, part of the reason, I guess, people haven't heard of us is that there is so much that can be done in this area. We have to concentrate our our quite limited resources in in a few areas. So we will focus on particular strategies and it may be helping with net zero, getting into the NHS. It may be a women's health strategy. So we we work with our local um, ICBs to sort of work out what the priorities are for, for the particular area and set our strategies according to that. Okay. And for those that, again, are unfamiliar, why is it important that the, the AHSN network or HIN network mm. exist for, well, for innovators, but also for the NHS? What, why is it important? Where do, where do they mm. kind of sit? I guess we very much sit as that, that middle independent person that can help bridge that gap between the innovator and the healthcare system. So people in the health system are often incredibly busy. 
just working to, to do the day job, to treat patients, to um, make sure things are run financially viably and safety and, and all those good things. Um, and it's hard for people to have headspace to work out about how they could innovate. Our job is to introduce ideas, help um, people meet and discuss innovative ideas and, and share best practice. And for innovators, it's very hard to get into the NHS. It's very hard to understand how it works, how they make procurement decisions, how you get to try a pilot. So for us, it's about saying, look, this is, this is the strategy currently in this particular area, particularly interested in, in women's health. Uh, you've got a product that might be of interest. Can you help us present it in such a way that we can introduce you to people who might be interested in that? Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, that healthcare, by its very nature, is built on the foundations of innovation, mm -hmm. is not it? I mean, the improvements to healthcare, we all see them all the time. And, mm. and digital health, which is kind of the title of, yeah. of, of, this, of this podcast, is really, it's exciting right now, isn't it? Because you've, you've got the apps, I think the apps have had their time, but they're very much just part of what people do. But it's the next, it's the next generation of digital health, isn't it? And dare I say AI, but yeah. that's a lot of people are talking about AI. What, what type of innovators are you, are you now seeing? Are you seeing a, a different type of innovator approaching mm -hmm. cancer in Sussex? Or are you seeing similar that, that it was? Is, is it different? It's both, is, is the answer. So I think the, the thing with innovation is innovation in one sector may be something that's been introduced 20 years ago in another sector. So if, if we take quite an extreme example, um, and I'll go back to working at Mars, you know, back 20 plus years ago, um, got rid of fax machines and introduced new technology. Whereas the NHS has only fairly recently got rid of fax <laughs> machines in some areas. And the new technology there might be something like text messaging, which has been around for an awful long time. So because of the difficulties of, of working with healthcare records and things like that, um, parts of the NHS have been incredibly slow to introduce things that are every day. Mm -hmm. uh, you then use the example of apps, and, and apps are every day, you know, we'll, we'll bank online and things like this. But actually using an app to book a healthcare appointment or see your test results is relatively new. And, and there's good reasons for that in terms of clinical safety, but equally that is innovative in, in parts of the healthcare yeah. system. So innovation is about introducing something new to that particular industry or sector. Yeah. Or something of that sort. And then there's a whole big discussion we can have about AI and automation. Yeah, we'll get to that. I think it, what's interesting from my perspective is as a, as a parent and booking, mm -hmm. trying to book appointments for, for my children, you know, yeah. to see the GP as and when you need to, mm -hmm. uh, is that we, we, we have to go online now and, and use yeah. a system to book, you fill out some information yeah. and they'll call you back if you're lucky and, and what mm -hmm. have you. Um, and, and I know that often the NHS or some parts of the NHS yeah. worry about patients being able to use new technology. Mm -hmm. But as you've just pointed out, actually, this isn't new technology. And the majority yeah. of patients don't really want to go online to book their appointment on a PC. Mm -hmm. They'll do it on their phone. So these, the, these little elements, I think, that the NHS have, have got wrong, mm -hmm. um, that they worry that the, the patients can't play catch up. Yeah. What, what, what do you think about that? I, th I think that you touch on some very valuable points there. I think there's a whole point about digital inclusion and, and health equalities. Uh, and we do a lot of work on that. So um, we, we've done work de designing a, one of my colleagues done a lot of work designing digital inclusion framework for innovators to use to ensure that they are considering all aspects of the risks of digital inequality for any innovation that, um, that's introduced within the NHS, which is really useful it's far more than a checklist, but to get people to think about how can people access this, how much data does it require, is there a way of accessing this through local resources, maybe the library, maybe through the schools, whatever else it might be, and having an alternative to, to digital as well. But digital works in so many different ways on so many different networks. It's, it's one word covers a whole ream of things. And actually we've just um, paid for an evaluation um, used with self-book, um, self-book innovation through Accurix, looking specifically at the impact of that on people from um, different demographic groups, um, found that for some, for some people actually they preferred to book appointments using an app or a link sent to them um, through a text message because it meant they didn't have to have a conversation with people when maybe English wasn't their first language. Mm or they could pick an appointment that was at a convenient time to them for something they might have felt slightly sensitive to talk about on the telephone. 
So it, it actually has been an enabler for some people to access an appointment that might not otherwise have accessed such an appointment. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I think one would immediately consider the elderly as mm. that as, as, as that group that may be, I guess, isolated from yeah. digital. But I think from my experience, it's not so much the elderly, maybe the elderly elderly. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's how you put it, <laughs> but um, maybe those above 80. Uh, for example, um, I know my great granddad always struggled with things, and, and that's fine. But my my parents don't, yeah. and um, the thought that other groups might benefit yeah. from digital, such as, like you say, those that might not want to discuss their symptoms online, yeah. or, sorry, on, on the on the phone, mm -hmm. or you know, are, are therefore more comfortable in just clicking a link, filling out some details, and mm -hmm. sending that off. And I'm sure there are other groups, um, certain religions and, yeah. and um, I think in women's health as well, that they may not be in a position to talk to a clinician yes. or a receptionist Absolutely. openly about some yeah. of the challenges that, they're, that they currently yeah. have. Yeah, and I think the classic examples of that are certain aspects of mental health, people don't always want to um, verbalise to a, a receptionist, and sexual health is, is the other thing that's, mm. that's often, there's a, there's a lot of information that shows that those um, particular um, presenting types, if you like, are, are covered a lot more through online consultation requests than through a, a verbal or a telephone uh, request. Yeah. And do you think then that what we're doing is enabling those that are, are possibly able to self-manage their conditions, mm -hmm. uh, those that are more, more than happy to fill out a form or click on a link that way, versus those that aren't, that need the extra support, and maybe those, those people get the time with the clinicians or, or the experts, as it were? Well, the, the theory is that if, if more people access things online, then that frees up time um, for people to have more time on the phone to a receptionist or something like that. And that, that's definitely true. We've seen studies that, that show that, where people have introduced different kinds of booking systems, it has freed up phone time, which is one of the frustrations that, that patients have. What it hasn't done, of course, is, is produce more GPs or clinical time. And that comes more through using the directing the request to the right person, because often it's not the GP who's the right person to do a request. It could be a mental health specialist, it could be a uh, musculoskeletal specialist, it could be somebody who deals with an administration request. And the default typically is, is the GP, and um, they, they should be seeing 40 to 50% of the cases that come into any practice, not 90 to um, yeah, 90 plus percent. Yeah, okay. And in, in your area, Kent, sorry, in Sussex, what are some of the, the innovations that you've seen, digital innovations mm -hmm. you've seen over the last 12 months that have sure. made you think, well, that's exciting. Yeah. That could make a difference. Sure. So, so what I've seen is uh, an app for people to record their menopause symptoms. Um, it's called Adora. It's, it's big in pilot uh, situation at the moment with just 10 people in Kent. Um, and the idea of that app is that you can record your symptoms, you can learn about the, what is the menopause, the different stages of menopause, so it's educational and it's being trialled alongside um, a, a GP who's particularly interested in the menopause, health and wellbeing coach who's particularly interested in it and a group of people effectively like in a menopause cafe who uh, talk to each other, compare symptoms and compare ideas about how they can help each other out um, and are all learning together. And the idea is through that, that you can reduce the number of appointments these individuals might need with a GP because they, they've been able to track what's going on. They understand the options and can have a very um, considered conversation with the GP and then go and trial whatever they're advised to trial, share that with their friends, colleagues in this menopause cafe and then go back as needed to the GP rather than often that of a toing and froing of appointments, which may take four or five appointments to come to a solution rather than hopefully just the one or the two. Okay, so that's great. So it sounds like those with, who are going through the same challenges yeah. or similar challenges are able to meet almost in a social way yeah. to discuss some of the symptoms or mm -hmm. some of the challenges that they have and maybe some solutions to those yeah. with other, uh, other sufferers, I guess, yeah. and say, rather than continually going to the GP yeah. because they don't know. Absolutely. Because you're, I guess it's that sh almost shared healthcare, mm -hmm. isn't it? Say, well, maybe this person might know yeah. The answer to this problem rather than having to, to use other GP and the benefits of that for the patient yeah. I guess are well, I guess they're twofold aren't they? you have some social interaction mm -hmm. um, a better understanding of your of your symptoms and, yeah. and your condition and then you're saying or suggesting that then 
when they go to see the GP or they, they go to yeah. a, a specialist, they're more informed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, the GP is not having to start at the beginning with, you know, this is what HRT is, or this is what these, these other options are. Um, they go, well, I've considered this, I've considered that, and I think I'd like to try this, rather than go away and have a think and then come back. So that's, that's definitely a benefit. And I think in terms of, you know, we talk about a huge demand on the healthcare system at the moment, the more patients can be informed and we can help patients be part of that conversation and informed about the decisions they've got, the, the better the solution is going to be. Yeah. And how do you go about, it's a pilot, yeah. how do you go about objectively or subjectively yeah. looking at the results of, of, you know, for, for 10 people in a small pilot to yeah. start with? How does that work? Do you help, do you help design that? Absolutely. So we've, we've helped with designing the evaluation questions. Things. So what does the innovator want to get out of it? Um, what does the, the health team want to get out of it? So we're looking at the impact on GP appointments. We're looking at the impact on the, the patients that are taking part in the trial. Um, and one of the things we want to consider, which is much harder to, to um, evaluate, is unmet need. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the um, themes really is that there's a, there's a huge unmet need for women who are going through various symptoms of menopause who are unaware that it may be the menopause and therefore are being treated for other conditions. And, and maybe that treatment is correct and maybe it isn't. But that's one of the things we're also trying to evaluate. So we're, we're actually currently seeking um, evaluation partners to help with that and linking in with uh, some aspects of academia who are researching that at the moment to see how we can link in with some of the research that's going on. You mentioned the, the clinicians mm -hmm. um, may not fully understand mm -hmm. what some of these women are, yeah. are going through. Is there an element then to suggest that these, this, these types of yeah. digital solutions are helping educate the clinicians that aren't the specialists, Absolutely. that aren't the gypsies, yeah. you know, that haven't got that, that, that special interest. Mm -hmm. So they become more aware of these uh, menopause, the, the conditions that you might not understand or... or yes. be, no, that, that's, that's very true. And you know, GPs, obviously, they will train at, at different stages in different ways, but menopause training is not something that some people would have been trained in um, if, it, if their training was a long time ago, or they may just have had a, a sort of a, a very short information brief on it. And these days, uh, there's a lot more of it in the news, but some people specialise in that, some don't. And it's, it helps everybody if they easy access information. If the patient could come and say, this is my understanding. Uh, it's much easier for the GP then to to have an informed conversation with them. And I think it's right that we and we understand that if 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 people understand and, and care about their own health needs yeah. and understand their conditions, mm -hmm. whether it's a long term condition or, or, or a temporary condition, they'll have better outcomes. Absolutely. So, what you're saying or suggesting, mm -hmm. and I think is absolutely right, is that these these digital health solutions. Enablers, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. They help enable a, a patient or patients yeah. or their carers and, and, and family to better understand and therefore manage their condition. Yes, yes, and it's on its own. An app on its own is is a help. But the particularly good thing about this pilot is it's it's an app that's working with um, a GP who's particularly interested in the menopause, with a team of people in a healthcare and primary care network. It's in Medway South who are particularly keen and already focused on this because they have health and well-being coaches who are already helping people and recognising the need and going, actually, if we link these people up, it could work better. So, And some patients are choosing to be part of a group, some aren't, but they're having individual conversations with health and well-being coaches. And then there's some, actually, we've got some mental health practitioners and they're dealing with some of the people who've got these symptoms. So maybe they could link up. And you start to see this sort of virtuous circle of ideas that come in and, and it grows and then you think this could have a really big impact mm -hmm. and it's exciting and we can also see an application there for the workforce um, because the NHS employs an awful lot of women of an age where they may be going through the menopause and that could be a huge benefit to uh, to those people as well. Yeah, lots of positives. Mm -hmm. Are there any obvious negatives or any dangers that we need to think about? You've already mentioned mm -hmm. not isolating certain sectors of, of communities. Yes. Are there any other dangers we need to be aware of or any negative aspects, do you think? I don't think there's negative aspects as such, as long as you, you recognise the digital inclusion. Um, there is um, obviously a, a very important point in terms of digital safety, in terms of making sure the information governance is done correctly. 
that uh, any innovator complies with all the appropriate regulations for any kind of digital innovation and that's whether or not it's a, a product that advises people about their health or whether it's something that's, that educates uh, there's, there's strict rules about that and that's one of the things we advise innovators on is making sure that they've got all the right checks in place before they are allowed or before we would recommend them to, to meet with any healthcare organisation. So the example of Adora is very interesting and, it, and opens up an area to explore digital health which is sure. I think, so that's a focus on women's health yeah. specifically isn't it? I, I think from my experience the areas of digital health, it really helps uncover those those specialities or those areas where there may not be as much focus mm -hmm. that you'd see and the and it almost forces sufferers sometimes I think to look at ways to they can innovate. It, are you finding, I don't know if a door is an example, yeah. um, some innovators that themselves have struggled with a condition and are looking to mm -hmm. to, to come to your, your, maybe the AHSN network and and for help. Yes, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, one of the drivers of innovation is, is personal experience and um, a good, another good example of that in the women's health space is an innovation called MUTU which exists to help uh, women who have got pelvic floor problems um, after giving birth and, and many women have issues after that. Some of those women suffer in silence for many many years because they're so busy with the baby and everything else that changes in their life, so they don't have time to, to worry or think about themselves and what they can do. Um, and Mutu is a, uh, an app or, or a programme you can follow of exercises that helps you manage um, any pelvic floor issues that you have um, to help you sort of get back to full strength where possible. Yeah. Um, and that is, is proving very effective um, in the private market and what we're trying to do is see if we can help find a way to introduce it to the NHS so that more women can benefit from that rather than suffering in silence. Yeah and digital health you mentioned the private market as mm. well I mean I know from experience that some healthcare insurers are now seem to be taking up a lot of the slack um, in terms of innovation so they'll offer for example as, as well as your monthly subscription yeah. they might offer a link to a mental health app mm -hmm. that they partnered with yes. or um, um, a Pilates app or yes. something like that. So do you think the digital health space is moving beyond the NHS? And if it is moving beyond the NHS, do you think that might be partly because the NHS aren't adopting it as, as fast as they maybe could or should? Absolutely. I mean, the, the argument is very much that the private market is, is ahead of the NHS and, and these apps have been available for people to purchase privately for, for quite a long time and in the example I gave there we're trying to find a way to even that out if you like and make it available to more of the population because unfortunately otherwise the, the private healthcare market takes those people that can afford it and their health gets better and those that can't afford it are excluded and the gap between those that have, have got the health support and those that haven't gets bigger and bigger and it's really important for us as a, as a country to make sure that we've got equal access to, to healthcare for, for everybody, for the health of the nation. Yeah, because healthcare inequality is a, is a, is a known problem, mm -hmm. um, and I guess we don't want a digital healthcare inequality no. alongside that. Mm -hmm. Because digital healthcare really, I think in its essence, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. or, or my thinking is that it, it almost should help with that inequality. Because whereas before you would have to go somewhere to see someone with limited resources, yes. you are now able to be anywhere and access this, this type of information. So, so digital healthcare should really be an enabler and, and, um, to, to even up where those yes. inequalities are. Yes, you're absolutely right. But it's all about how it's done mm. and, and, and how do you uh, address that inequality. So we've talked previously about um, the fact that we've got a a strategy to, to address health inequalities and, and ways of helping innovators consider any sort of inequality that might be um, unintentionally part of the design of, of whatever they've, um, their innovation is. But we're also focusing on, on where are populations missing out. So we know that coastal populations, um, particularly in Kent but also in parts of Sussex, don't um, have as good health outcomes as other parts of that, those particular counties in, in Kent and Sussex. So why is that? What's missing? And what can we do to, to support those particular communities access better health care? 
sometimes that might be through digital health, sometimes it might be through other means. But as you said, digital health is an enabler, and if we can enable some people to access digital healthcare and access healthcare in a different way, it can then free up time for um, healthcare professionals to spend face to face time with those that need face to face time or to put healthcare into, into different environments. So, one organisation, um, Primary Care Network, has actually set up um, healthcare checks, if you like, in a shopping centre to, to help people check their, their blood pressure and, and things of that sort. So it's easy to do and you can help people with the prevention and education agenda just when they're going about their normal daily business and it's not a special trip to the, to the GP practice or somewhere else for that. Okay, and the AHSN, mm -hmm. um, soon to be HINs, mm -hmm. with, in terms of innovation, innovation and innovators, you're very much going to guide or help guide yeah. these ideas al along the correct path to, to find the, the validation yes. uh, required to, to be able to sell or, mm. or to work with and partner with the NHS, is that, is that correct? That's right. I mean, one of the key things, obviously, the NHS has got very limited funding. There's, there's huge pressure on budgets at the moment. So making the case for innovation, making the case for changing your pathway and how you provide a service to somebody or to, to residents, to patients, you have to be able to show the, the business case for it and that it's economically viable and better for people's um, healthcare and that takes evidence that takes an, an evaluation of a new idea and that all takes time as well so putting together that that pilot that that test bed if you like and then looking at the evidence of how effective it's been and saying is this worthwhile doing long term all takes time and, and energy to put that together and then make the business case so that things can be changed longer term yeah and I guess for some innovators even at that point mm it's very difficult to sell yes. or partner with the NHS, isn't it? Yeah. Because I, I think naturally people are adverse to change, um, good or bad. Yeah. Um, so that can be a challenge and maybe that's where the private healthcare may, may take some of that up because yeah. you've got the healthcare inequality challenge. Mm -hmm. I've, I'm interested to explore and understand if you, if you have any other innovators or in, in, that you're working with right now, it'd be nice to mention them yeah. at the end actually, we can put some links to um, mm -hmm. Adora and Mutu at, yes. the, at the end of this podcast. Um, if there are any other innovators that you're working with that we, that we could talk about now. Sure. So I think in the, in the primary care space, when I talk to um, people that work in primary care and say, you know, what would really help you with innovation? They come back with one word, which is workload. That, that it's all about the workload and how do you address the overwhelming demand that primary care faces today. And we know there's lots of strategies out there for, for dealing with that. You've got things like the, um, the R's roles and looking at different ways of, of handling demand coming into a, a GP practice. Um, and one of the areas we've been looking at particularly is how to use automation within primary care to help with some of the routine administration tasks that are done on a daily basis that may require um, some level of clinical input but not a high level of clinical input. So things like uh, reviewing normal blood results, for example, mm. or making sure everybody with their long-term condition gets a gets a check, an annual check done. And if you can automate some of these processes that are already driven by an algorithm, you can free up some clinician time so they can focus on um, patients that really need the time of the clinician to deal with on a one-time basis. Yeah. And that's that's a very interesting project to be involved in, but as you were referring to earlier, it's one of those things that, because it's only it's very early days in the spread of that innovation, finding the evidence to support it and build the business case going forward takes takes time. And you've got to have a few people at the very beginning going, taking the leap of faith and going, I believe this is going to work. I'm going to dedicate some time and money to that mm. uh, and try it because I believe it's going to work. And we're very lucky to be working with a, a couple of innovators in that space, both from within primary care themselves. So, so one's a GP who's um, designed a product called GP Automate, which does automate things like, like test results and registrations and sending out Flores questionnaires to patients. And, and he's proven that he's saved his GP practice a lot of time and gained more money through quaff points and increased prevalence and things like that to, to make the case to, to carry that on. And he's now got a, a business that's in, I think, 30 different practices already uh, across England. So it's exciting to, to be part of that journey and, and help with um, making more people aware of, of that product 
That's interesting because I think it's very difficult to prove increased or positive health outcomes sometimes at the early mm-hmm. stage with doctors, isn't it? Yeah. And therefore, if you can demonstrate a saving of resource or, to, or time and, and helping with the pressures, yeah. that can be as good as. Absolutely. And then one can assume that the, the health outcomes would be improved with the patients and mm-hmm. the patient journeys, etc. further on. So and I, I think that once you get to that element of understanding from the procurement departments, maybe, that you don't have to prove that the health outcomes right at the beginning, but just show and demonstrate that this helps clinicians with their time. Absolutely. And their colleagues with their time as well, yeah. and everything that, that feeds out of it. So yeah. that's it. I, I do find that incredibly interesting. And I, I know we've spoken about primary care mm. quite a lot. I'm, I'm interested to know if you do much work with secondary care and if you have or able to deal with the challenge of primary care and secondary care communicating or talking better and if digital health you think can improve that or enable that. Absolutely. So the whole, um, we, work, we work across the whole uh, healthcare sector. So we work with, with secondary care and community care and uh, everything within the healthcare sector. And the, you're absolutely right. You know, these, the communication between primary and secondary care is, is key. And there's a lot of wasted resource that, that goes into that area for, for a whole range of reasons we won't go into now. But um, yes, we've done, done work with um, both secondary care and primary care, looking at that interface, how they communicate. And a, probably a good example there is discharge letters that, that come out from, from secondary care. Uh, and as we know, they go into primary care in many different formats. Um, and primary care then have to code and decipher those letters and work out whether they need follow-up tests, follow-up um, changes to prescriptions, all sorts of things. And there are a number of digital products that are in that space already to try and help with processing that information. Um, and I've worked with innovators who are designing better ways of doing that and, and um, coding and, and things using AI, which is quite exciting in terms of seeing some of the developments that, that are going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, but also you then go back to the very beginning going, why is it that we're having to do so much innovation in primary care to address that problem when you could address the problem at source and go, why are secondary care sending out so many different types of letter, different styles with different information in different places and even describing diabetes in five different ways? Why can't we just have one, one way of doing this? Um, which begs a much bigger question about the whole way that we, we do things across the healthcare sector. I mean, that's a space that we work in ourselves, actually, uh, interoperability and uh, having one single source of truth in terms of a document you mentioned diabetes and mm-hmm. discharge as We work in that space ourselves. But I think, well, you mentioned AI, Jenny, mm. so <laughs> we can't ignore it. No. Let's, let's explore that a bit further in terms of there's a lot of, I think, anxiety mm-hmm. amongst everybody, but specific, specifically and particularly clinicians. Mm who are concerned about AI and what that might bring. But there are others that are innovators, again, yeah. that see the opportunity and are excited about that. Mm. Um, and we hear good examples all the time. I, I don't think we hear the bad examples. Maybe they'll come. What, what are your thoughts personally? And, and on top of that, do the AHSNs have, a, have a, a stance in terms of AI, how you engage with those types of innovators? Yes, absolutely. I mean, AI is very much the, the future and we are working with a number of innovators who are already in that space and, and developing innovations in that space. I think one of the best examples that people seem reasonably comfortable with now is, is the way AI has been used um, with lung checks to, to help look at x-rays for people who may have cancer and been screened for cancer and how AI there has been tested very rigorously and been shown to be very effective at spotting potential cancers in, in x-rays. And that's been able to uh, increase the processing time for for those um, those X-rays. So that's a really positive example. And I think most people are now comfortable enough. Checks have been done um, with humans checking the AI to go this this works. And because the AI is learning, it's getting more and more refined at, at what it can pick up and pick up picks up things that a human might not necessarily see. Um, and we have to go that learning curve in in other areas on AI as well. So within, within primary care, I know AI is being used um, as, as part of a triage tool to, be, to look at the online consultation requests that come in um, and, and pick out keywords uh, and then become more sophisticated in what it does. So if somebody says, I've got a condition and I need to see a physiotherapist, 
it can pick up that word and, and do sense check for red flags and then direct them through to a, an MSK practitioner who can help them directly work without having to go through many different other steps along the way. So there's some good examples of how it's being used effectively to, to process information rapidly and to, to learn from that. Um, but there's other areas where we've gone, this is, at the moment, we're not ready to, to use AI to actually you know, diagnose issues or, or something like that at the moment. Um, we've got a medical director who's leading on our AI programme and we're very conscious that we need to make sure we've got some very robust checks and balances in place with AI. Yes, of course. It's, it's exciting, yes. isn't it? Um, very exciting, I think. And we'll be, we're we're going to see more of it, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Jenny. I just want to maybe ask you if there are innovators that, that look at the, the vodcast, how they may contact you or other HSM, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, the best thing to do is to go to our website, Kent Sarah and Sussex Academic Health Science Network. Uh, we've got a contact us uh, link on there. So, yeah. So thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much for your time today in sunny Guildford. Pleasure. We will um, we'll put some links mm -hmm. for Mutu, Adora, and and your your AHSN network mm -hmm. after after the podcast, so people can sure. get in touch. Great, great. Thank you.